All right. Hey. Um, I'm not going to sit because, as you can tell, I can't sit still. <laughs> it is physically impossible. Hi. I know. They're so mean to you. <laughs> um, my name is Melissa. I am the youngest of five, two of which you know, Heather and Christy. I am the baby. And just a little bit about me. I, we are pastor's kids. We grew up in church. Um, some truth took a little bit longer to sink in for some of us. Um, but, but we did grow up in the church. And I am currently the worship leader in whatever else pastor needs me to do title at Fellowship Baptist Church in High Ridge. So that's where I am. I've been there for 12 years, which is a really long time in ministry. I don't know if you guys know that, but it is. And, um, and Jean is longer. Way to go. Uh, at the same church anyway. So um, yes, I've been there for 12 years and um, do the music. I, I like music. It's cool. And so that's kind of a little bit about me. My husband, Jason, who is our drummer, who's probably sneaking off eating snacks back there. We have been married since 2008, whatever that is. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 15 years. Um, and we have two boys. We got two and we we're like, done. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the ginger... 11 year old that you saw running around, that's one of my boys. And then the one sliding in socks, that was my younger one. So yes, very, very active boys. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, so tonight I am tasked, today, sorry, I'm used to teaching on Wednesday nights. Today I am tasked with the last verse. And um, I said, Heather, just tell me what verse you want me to do. And she's like, I kind of want you to do the last one. I was like, okay, that's what I'll do. But um, we're actually going to read the whole thing because I can do that. All right, so go ahead. And then the words will be on the screen. You can follow along. You can listen along. You can read along in your Bible. But let's take a moment. Take a deep breath. <laughs> and let's read this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All of these verses, one through five, have been leading to this verse. Verse six. All of these verses precede this one verse. All of these verses are the evidence for the truth found in verse six. It makes the case for verse six. Without verses one through five, verse six would not be as compelling. He says, Surely, this is a word of confidence, right? It is because of all of these five verses that he can say with confidence, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. He's not saying maybe. He's not saying I hope. He's not being wishful in his thinking. David is confident that all of these verses are the reason why he can say with confidence, surely his goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Verse one, we learned he is provider. We lack nothing. We lack no good thing. He is a good shepherd, not a bad shepherd. He is a good shepherd, a good provider. Verse two, he is our nurturer, caring for us, giving us the fresh distilled waters, giving us green pastures for us to nourish from. He is our nurturer. He gives us rest. He gives us quiet. Verse three, he is our restorer. 
He's the one that comes to us when we're legs up, belly up, flipping us around, putting warmth back into our legs, saying, you got this. He is our restorer, the one guiding us, leading us into righteous living, making right choices. We learned he is our protector in verse four, not just that, our defender, our hope in darkness. Verse five, once again, he's a provider, not just any provider, but an abundant provider, preparing a table that is only made possible because of what he did, not anything we did. He anoints us with his Holy Spirit. He blesses us. And that is why all five of these verses, he says in verse six, surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. It's not a Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. There's no question mark here. This is confident, assured belief, not a wishful thinking. When I think of the word surely, my mind goes to like the movie Airplane or yeah, Leslie Nielsen. It's a goofy movie. He get, he's a doctor. He gets into the driver's or pilot, that's what they do, pilots, pilot planes, not drivers. Um, and the pilot goes, surely you can't be serious. And he goes, I am, and don't call me Shirley, right? <laughs> that's what I think when I think of Shirley. It's not, it's not an assurance, it's a hopeful wish. Like, surely they're going to have snacks at this conference, right? Surely someone's going to think to bring a cardigan because it might get a little chilly in here, right? Surely, it's like this sarcastic thing that we use it as. But he's not using this in sarcasm. In other versions, it says, only, surely, confident assurance. There is no question mark. He has a confident insurance in the character of God that says, I know for a fact his goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. So he's confident of this goodness, this mercy, loving kindness, different translations might say. His faithful love, as another translation might say. He's confident in the goodness of God. He cannot be anything but good, according to David. That is who he is. The experiences of what God has done and is doing in David's life, prove to him the goodness of God. We see it from cover to cover of scripture. In the very beginning, Genesis 1:31, God saw everything that he had made, and what he say? Oh, yeah, right there. <laughs> it was not just good, very good. God is good. What he does is good. Exodus 18:9. The Israelites have come out of Egypt and they have been um, redeemed by God. Jethro, father-in-law of Moses, he wasn't even in Egyptian slavery. He was the outsider looking in. Jethro rejoiced over all the good things. Good things the Lord has done for Israel when he rescued them from the power of Egyptians. And not just in the wilderness, from captivity to captivity, from returning to captivity to exile, all the different things, the personal deliverance that God has given the Israelites time and time throughout scripture has been deemed good. Philippians 1, 6 proves it. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Will bring it to completion. And this is what Revelation 21, 1 through 6, or 7, I don't have this up there, but it says... Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I saw Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Skip down to verse five. He who is seated at the throne, behold, I am making all things new. And what do we already know about the creation of God? It was very good. So from cover to cover, God is good. God does good things. Too many references. I could spend all night giving you scripture about how God is good, how he is good. 
His promises are good. His commands are good. His gifts are good. His sovereignty is good. Scripture tells us just his name is good. What a beautiful name. His name is good. 2 Timothy 2.13. We are faithless, but he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He cannot be anything but what he is, and he is God. Numbers 23.19. God is not man, <laughs> that he should lie or lowercase son of man, that he should change his mind. Has he not said and will he not do it? Or has he not, has he not spoken, will not fulfill it? He's like, yeah, God is who he says he is. He cannot be anything but God. We are, are so prone to wander, so prone to wishy-washiness, right? Man, we're, we're prone to lying, we're prone to flip-flopping. That is who we are, but that is not God. God cannot deny his character. He can't be anything but good. He was good then, he's good now, and he will always be good. Notice in this psalm, the subject of the psalm, what's the very first word? The Lord. When we read this psalm, we need to realize this is a psalm not about us but about the Lord. Lord God Yahweh, I am who I am. I am the self-existent God Almighty, creator God who spoke life into existence, who breathed breath into our bodies. That is who this psalm is about. We seek comfort from it. We seek confidence. We seek strength from it. But we cannot forget, this is all about who he is. He is is good. Life doesn't always feel good, but our situations do not affect the character of God. The character of God affects how we walk through situations. It doesn't feel good to take rest. I'm like Chrissy. I'm not, I'm not good at that. That's hard for me. I'm used to running a million miles an hour because if I have to slow down, then I have to hear things inside my head right? When I slow down too much, then I start to question everything I said, did, or didn't do, right? I'm the one that lays down at night, ready for rest, and is like, this is all the things you did wrong today. <laughs> this is how you could have done this better. Somebody could have done this better. I don't like rest because I'm alone with my thoughts, and we, and we don't want that, right? I don't like rest. I don't like rest, but the good shepherd doesn't care what I like. Well, he does care. Okay, I shouldn't have said that. The good shepherd gives me what I need, not always what I like. I don't like quiet waters. Same reason. It's too quiet. I can start hearing the voices that say I'm not good enough or someone else can do this so much better than me. But my good shepherd knows I need those quiet waters so he can speak truth into the lies. I don't always want to do the right thing. <laughs> I don't, sometimes I want to eat the chicken nuggets in the corner, right? I don't want to always do the right thing. Sometimes the easy thing is what I want to do. It would just be easier sometimes if I didn't always have to do the right thing, if I didn't have to speak up for my faith in a situation, or if I didn't have to correct sometimes. But, oh, again, the good shepherd gives me what I need and not I want. I definitely don't want to walk down darkest valley. I don't think anybody wants to do that. I don't want to walk down dangerous paths. But my good shepherd, who is full of goodness and mercy, is with me, turning the ugly things into beauty. And that's what he does. I can't remember the scripture, and I should have referenced this. He takes ashes, and he makes something beautiful from them. He can grow from, he makes dead things alive. Whatever situation, whatever path I'm walking in, I have a good shepherd. Again, I don't want to walk through those, but my good shepherd knows what I need more than what I know I need. And why? Because he's good. He is good and faithful in love. Yet this goodness and faithful love is not just following me, right? But the word here for follow means pursue. It pursues me. This actually originally is like a military term. It was used for, um, in the form of attacking. <laughs> so the goodness and faithful love of God is chasing after us 
as if almost to overwhelm us, right? He's saying, no matter where I go, David says, no matter where I go, no matter what circumstance I find, my good shepherd's goodness and mercy are running right after me. Whatever I walk into, he is actively pursuing me whenever I walk into this situation. Again, not a wish, but an assurance, surely, When I walk into that meeting, your goodness and mercy are with me. When I walk into this family situation, your goodness and mercy are with me. Surely when I walk into the doctor's office, your goodness and mercy are with me. Whatever you're walking into, say it with confidence. Surely your goodness and mercy are with me. With confidence. Our life circumstances change, but one thing does not change. And that is God. His goodness and mercy are with me. And again, his goodness is unaffected by my circumstance. And then if that's not enough, right, where does his mercy and goodness follow us to? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Your mercy and goodness follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, think about this, though. This was written in an Old Testament, Old Covenant time. To be in the presence of God was not an easy task. To actually physically be in his presence was almost an impossible task. Once a year, there was a high priest that went into the Holy of Holies after going through a bajillion different rules and regimens and making himself completely pure, making a sacrifice for his sins and the sins of the people. And then after wearing the right garments out of the right threads and the right fabrics with the right colors, then he could go into the presence of God and hope he did it all right. (laughs) Right? Once a year, one man, a Levite priest. So for David, son of Jesse, tribe of Judah, not a Levite, not a priest. He says, I'm going to dwell in God's presence forever. That's where he wanted to be. He was going to dwell. And again, this is confident. This is not a hope. He says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. The man who had never been in the Holy of Holies or the physical presence of God was confidently stating that he's going to be with God forever. He was going to be for God, God forever. With every breath, until the very last day is what he said. All my days, every breath that I am able, he wants to be in the eternal worship of God, in the presence of God. Our eternal worship of God in his presence is only made possible by the goodness of God. Because in his goodness, he sent the perfect lamb to be slain so that we could enter into that eternal rest with him. Do we have that confidence? Do we have that confidence in that verse? Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's saying it with confidence. We can be confident, because Acts 16, 31 tells us, if we believe on the Lord Jesus, we will be saved. This is more than just a one-time event, right? This is more than just a knowledge of God. Are we just looking at the table? Are we accepting the gift he has given us? Are we not just believing in him, but believing on him, putting full trust in the shepherd? This is not a set it and forget it faith, right? This is active sanctification, active continual sanctification. I think I skipped a page. Nope, I didn't. Okay, cool. This present tense idea. And so here we have this verse. And I, and I, as I was studying this verse, these words just kept coming to my mind. And it was like, man, if I walk into a situation without that confidence that says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of the life, I, I really need to read verses one through five. I really need to read and understand verses one through five. But it's because of those five verses that I can say with confidence that God is pursuing 
me. I am walking in his goodness and mercy. We're going to walk through valleys, as we've talked about several different times. Whether we're in one, came out of one, or going into one, we're going to be there. We don't know what is coming, but we have confidence in the one who is with us. We believe on him. We put our whole trust in him. Why? Because he is good. It may not feel good. It may not look good. But again, our circumstances unaffect, or our, God's character is unaffected by our circumstance. He is still good. In his goodness, he made a way for us to come to the table, for us to have that eternal rest with him. In his goodness, he sent his son to pay a debt, to drink the cup of wrath that we could never, never fulfill. We could not, we could not even begin to understand the suffering that God went through to drink for his son to drink that cup. But again, we know it's more than just eternity with him, more than just dwelling with him, but the abundant life we have with him now. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. He is the good shepherd. He came to give us life and life to the full. Do we have confidence in that? Can we say surely? I don't know how many times I underline surely in my notes because I need to be reminded of the promises of God so I can have confidence in, the, in his words. Do we have that same confidence? Believer, do we have that confidence when we're walking through the sanctification process? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. You are good, and nothing we do can even come close to how good you are. But I'm so glad it's not about my goodness. I'm eternally grateful for your goodness. In your goodness, you sent your son to make a way I could not, I could not even begin to make. God, I pray that we would understand these truths and have confidence in them. And where we lack and doubt, God, help our unbelief. Where we lack in confidence, help us to remind ourselves daily of your truth, to block out the lies of the enemy. And to remind ourselves, surely your goodness and mercy pursue after me. God, help our, our worship to be pleasing to you. Not just in the songs we sing, but in, in the way we act and react. In the way we walk in our everyday life. God, thank you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen.